Hi there, and welcome to The Artist Craft. I'm your host, Stacy Cochran, and we've got an excellent guest in studio today. Luleen Anderson has driven all the way from Wilmington, North Carolina to be with us, and she is the author of four books. Sunday came early this week, Fill Me Up to Empty, Under the Covers, and The Knack of a Happy Life, which I have a copy of here. Uh, Luleen has a PhD from Boston University and practiced clinical psychology for many years in Massachusetts and later in Wilmington, where she currently lives. Thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you. Well, let's start with the most fundamental question of all. Why do you write? Probably the simplest answer is I have to. I tell people who ask about writing, if you don't have to, don't do it. <laughs> but if you do, mm -hmm. honor it. For me, it's my creative outlet. It allows me to share what I know as a, as a human being, as a psychologist, and as a writer, uh, which is a, a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. It's a way of communicating, sharing your thoughts, and processing through it. Yes. So, what is your personal motivation? What, what re really drives you to, to start a new project when you start writing a book? What is, what, what is that really drives you? Well, I've been writing for 20, 30 years, and so it's hard to define a moment. I have always been interested in telling stories. I've always been interested in listening to stories mm -hmm. and learning what, uh, what they have to teach us and trying to retrieve central truths, mm -hmm. universal truths from those stories. As a psychologist, I appreciated the importance of listening and hearing people's stories. So when I discovered that I had a knack for writing, which I discovered in high school hmm. when I wrote an assignment about writing a story to the song on top of Old Smokey. And my youngest sister got furious at me because I made it too sad and made her cry, and she mm. wanted me to change the story. So that's pretty heady to have that kind of impact. Sure. But I also uh, went to college to major in journalism. I didn't know what kind of writing I wanted to do, but at the end of my freshman year, and I was there on scholarship, so I couldn't make mm -hmm. a move, they dropped, the college dropped the journalism major. Mm -hmm. So my parents thought maybe I would see that as some sign that I should change my major mm -hmm. and be a teacher. But I switched to psychology, which I think was a good thing to do because it allows me to bring that into my writing, but I'm very interested in nonfiction, in selecting stories and vignettes that capture something that I think is uh, essential to, uh, to our journey. Sure. Well, let's talk a little bit about growing up in the small community of Roberta, Georgia. Yes. Now, how did that uh, small town background and childhood influence and inform you as an adult? I think it influenced and informed the kind of writing. Uh, again, just seeing stories walking <laughs> on the dirt road or seeing stories uh, played out in front of my eyes. Uh, people in a small town know everybody and know everybody's business and know what you're supposed to be doing and if you're not doing it. And so there is a kind of community intimacy mm. that lends itself later to describing uh, in stories. And I tend to write about the individual and then to try to extrapolate uh, to the more general. Uh, and that's a genre that works well for me. The, the first book, um, Sunday came early this week, is the story of my work with a suicidal anorexic adolescent girl. And she was a good, good writer, so I knew early that I could use her work as well as my own. I should say that as a psychologist, I do not write about clients without their permission and without changing material. So this teenager and her parents had asked me to write her story. So 
all of that comes together uh, into a creative effort to share one young woman's journey in such a way that it can be instructive, not only to other teenagers, but to those working with them. My goal is to sort of disseminate uh, helpful information um, to people who can benefit from it. And now going back to the question that I asked just a moment before, it sounds like that the through the form of nonfiction, there's something maybe more realistic about that or practical perhaps that, that you're able to utilize through writing nonfiction. I think that's a good way of putting it. I think there is something important about listening skills. Uh, being a good listener is not easy. If it were, we wouldn't hear in households across America every night, why don't you just listen to me? So since I think as a therapist I'm a good listener, then being able just to share what I've heard comes easy for me. That's an easy thing for me to do is to share somebody else's story. It also has allowed me, and as writers we have to look at that, to sort of protect my own self and not put uh, mm. as much of myself in, in my earlier writings as editors began to say I needed to do. And that's been a challenge to share so that readers know as much about me as they do about, in this case, the teenager or the young man in Fill Me Up to Empty. Now what was it like having eight brothers and sisters? <laughs> well, I'm eight out of nine. Uh, and my parents were sharecroppers. And uh, my mother got through third grade, my father through fifth grade. And, and so we lived on a farm and had a house to live in uh, with no electricity or outdoor plumbing. Uh, in return for uh, harvesting, we got part of the fruits of the of the harvest or the labor. And so that in itself was an interesting experience. But being on the on the tail end of a large family means different things at different points in your life. My, one of my earliest memories is of my oldest sister being married on our front porch mm. and my father being annoyed about something so he went out and sat in his pickup in the backyard and refused to come to the wedding. That's my mm. earliest memory. But some of my older siblings uh, began to feel more like aunts and uncles because they were married and away. Uh, but the main thing I think was my moving into educational circles. I'm the mm -hmm. first of the nine children to ever go to college and uh, that was big enough in my little town. But then to go on to mm -hmm. get a master's and a doctorate, uh, my parents just didn't understand what that was about. And my father, my, my favorite story about my father is that he thought when I finished my undergraduate degree that I would come back to Roberta and get a job, which he had arranged, to teach wow. English in the high school. And of course, I would live at home because that would mm -hmm. save money. Mm -hmm. So when he announced this grand plan and found that I was Without going consulting to. You. Exactly. <laughs> well, it was just a big surprise. He couldn't imagine that mm -hmm. I wouldn't just be, you know excited to death. Well, so when I went on to Emory, he mm -hmm. thought, well, you know, she's just getting a little more learning. While I was at Emory, there was some overtures to my coming back to my undergraduate alma mater, Wesleyan College, which was 20 miles away from Roberta. So he thought, well, at least she'll be nearby. So then when he heard that I was going to Boston University for a PhD, he said to me, I used to think you was the smartest one in the bunch, but it show is taking you a long time to learn something. Hmm. <laughs> so, 